You're watching Drake Queen Gaming. Enjoy the video. Hello everyone, Nary here from Drakewing Gamers, so if you know me on Twitter, The Gaming Dragon, today I'm coming back at you another Let's Play episode of Far Beyond the World. So the last place we left off, we actually joined Varissa out in the forest, we're helping her with some chores, she was telling us a bit more about the tribe and their customs and how, you know, what happens when females come of age, stuff like that, and her special circumstances for not having to basically go into an arranged mating or whatever it is. But anyway guys, sit back and enjoy me entertain you for the next 20 minutes and let's jump right in. Also, if I can... If I can ask something very simple of you guys, if you see, uh, bots have been kind of swarming the videos lately, if you see any bots making weird comments, just don't be afraid to report it. It, it definitely saves me a lot of work. Uh, yeah, it, it, it really helps. <laughs> but anyway, guys, let's jump right in. All right, alarm chain, you're up. All right, let's go. <clears throat> Less kind among the tribe might question if it was actually he who finally accomplished the task. That sort of thing stays with a male for the rest of his life. Versa admits uncomfortably, kneeling next to a small clump of mushrooms. So, all in all, we females don't have the bad end of the stick. There's no doubt if the pup is ours. She plucks a few of she plucks a few of them, giving them an idle sniff. All this sounds so incredibly wrong. Hmm? She ponders, standing up and giving me a telling look. I'm not trying to be judgy, I protest, lifting my hands up. I'm just trying to understand your culture. From what you say, it's just a self perpetuating system that is driven by fear and paranoia. In fact, it prevents you from considering your true feelings and attachments because your reputation is at stake. Well, when you put it that way, I suppose you're right. She shrugs, turning away and approaching another bush. How else would you put it? I ask as she looks between the leaves, picking at oval red berries. I mean, even you yourself admitted that you're glad to be outside of it, capable to make that call when you want and with whom you want. Deep down, you know it's how it's supposed to be. I wouldn't go that far. She refutes indifferently, still focused on her task. True, it's nice to have a sense of agency from time to time. However, if I were forced to mate with my intended, I would have pups by now. That wouldn't be the worst outcome, would it? The female finally faces me with a weak smile to put an emphasis behind her question. And once I had that out of the way, I'd find time to seek love and companionship. Just as countless wolves did before me. As it happens, right now neither motherhood nor a soulmate are at the top of my priorities, so all possible outcomes are entirely indifferent to me. She shrugs, giving me something to think about. I guess she really does look at things from a wider perspective. It's nearly impossible not to admire her stoicism, although I struggle to understand it. Hmm. For someone so young, and you are young, both body and soul, you must place a lot of your attention on romantic feelings. Versa reiterates, looking deep into my eyes. You're without, mem you're, you're without memories, away from home at monks, creatures you see for everything. But what they truly are, your enemies. Your life is on the line, Orion. I swallow heavily as her voice takes on a rather serious tone. I'd suggest you rid yourself of all childish notions for the nearest future. It will help us all a great deal. She laughs me off and proceeds to walk deeper into the forest. Despite feeling foolish, I try not to show it and walk briskly next to her. The woods become denser and darker as the thick canopy above us acts like a blanket. Versa is clearly on the lookout for some herbs, a task in which I have little to, con a task in which I have little to contribute. The protracting silence begins to grate me, and I consider her last words carefully. Instead of focusing on triviality, I need to think more about our current predicament. I decide to touch upon a matter I meant to discuss with them for a while now. Speaking of something that could help us a great deal, I recently discovered that I speak different languages. Yes, Wolven being the prime example. She teases, shaking her head. No, I mean, I don't know how to explain this, but I don't hear other languages. Rather, uh... The female takes a stop and gives me a curious glance. They all blend into one. What do you mean? So you know how you hear Wolven, right? Yes. That's how all languages sound to me. Huh? She sounds confused. The chief at the feast, I understood what he was saying in those human languages. Granted, I assumed you would. I met with a shrug. You are a human, after all. No, you don't get it. I tried to figure out how best to spell it out for her and then remembered my exchange with Trist. Uncertain if I should spill that little nugget of information or not, I hesitate for a moment. I mean, we did make a truce, and throwing him under a bus like that doesn't seem like keeping doesn't seem like me keeping the mind of the bargain. Reluctantly, I decide to keep my knowledge of Sylvan to myself for the time being. Not sure what paranoia could feed into the hearts of these wolves. Perhaps they'd think I am a spy, but the human languages should be enough to convince her. When he spoke human, it sounded exactly the same as Wolven does. In fact, I in fact either of the human dialects sounded the same. Hmm. 
She thinks for a moment, looking rather perplexed. Despite her collected outward appearance, I can see she's struggling with the concept. Isn't it how multilingual people function? What? Now I'm the one thrown off, blinking at her question. I mean, I don't even know how speaking another language works. Wolven is all I know. I never had the need to learn another language. Doesn't it auto-translate into your mother tongue in your head? Huh? I'm stumped. I mean, yes, sort of. I get increasingly confused, not even accounting for the possibility that she doesn't speak any other language. But you should be able to tell the difference, even if you subconsciously understand the meaning behind the words, they're not the same. But you do understand them subconsciously, she points out. By your own admission, that's how it works, right? I guess? My conviction, my conviction falters. She's going to rationalize it, isn't she? I still shouldn't hear them as one and the same. But how do you know if it's not the other way around? Perhaps it's the woven that sounds to you like your mother, your mother tongue. I, uh... I mean, she isn't wrong, but it doesn't make her right either. I'd say it's just confusion caused by the trauma that's behind your memory loss. Your mind is trying to make sense of more important matters than language barriers, so it skips them. She shrugs and continues to walk away, almost as if letting me know she's done with the subject. B but I sigh. I guess... I'm surprised by her dismissiveness, but without even, revel without even revealing I speak Sylvan, there's little chance to make her reconsider. And since she's the most reasonable of the trio, I doubt I'll have any more luck with either Rannick or Vool. Defeated, I shake my head and decide to simply enjoy the stroll for what, what it's worth. I watch as she inspects different growths, picking through their leaves and berries. She places some kind of some of the greenery into my basket, and the silence continues. As it drags on, I begin to feel rather uncomfortable. Desperate for another topic, I think back to the morning exchange between Korra and Tano. It got me curious about the relationship between the White Wolf and Rannick. There's one more thing I was meaning to ask you. Lucky me. This morning, when I was in Tano's and Korra's company, quite inadvisably, I might add, she interjects with a clearly displeased tone. Well, they talked about him and Rannick, about their friendship and eventual falling out. Hmm? I can see she feigns interest and surprise, clearly wanting me to continue with the quarry without having to add anything unprompted. I was just wondering, why did they fall out? And you're asking me this because... You're Rannick's friend, are you not? I am. She stops, giving me a quite perplexed look. And that is why I hold my peace on matters that do not concern me. If you wish to know what happened and should he want to divulge, that is his story to tell. Unless you mean to ask Tano. The female shrugs mockingly. Otherwise, it's just hearsay. Despite being sassy with me on occasion, this is the first time I see her being this touchy. Almost as if Rannix and Tano's falling out was more than just that. My curiosity aside, I decide not to confront her further and just drop it. Although it's good to know that she keeps her friend's confidence. It makes me ashamed that I even asked. In truth, I'd definitely rather hear this from Rannick. Conversation going nowhere, I just observe as she goes about her business picking different herbs and explaining their names as we continue. Yarrow, Rosemary, Silvi Salvia, and Silverleaf. All meaning very little to me, but being quite important to her work. Well, Rosemary is, a, is one in your world. I try, to pay as, I try to pay attention as much as I can as I deposit them into my basket, but my simple mind can handle only so little. They're just green leaves to me, aside from an occasional clump of moss or a shroom. Well, you're not a botanist, so... Witch Elm, which is apparently imp important for healing ointments, like the one used on my stab. She wedges her rusty but trusty blade into the duck bark to gain another few chips, as well as harvest some leaves. Could you look around for the moss? The female asks idly, continuing to pick through the branches. Sure. I nod, walking off some distance and checking various trees. Not far off, I find a tall birch covered with the green growth. Is this one okay? I call out, and she leans from behind her witch elm. Not sure what's so witchy about it. It looks like a regular tree to me. No, that's not the one I'm looking for. I need moon moss or swan's neck. Preferably both. Varissa grumbles, struggling with a more, st with, with more stubborn of the elm's limbs. Yeah, that tells me a lot. Moon moss is blue and tint and has small white polyps at the end of each stalk. Swan's neck, she huffs. Has a fern like leaves with stalks bent in the shape of a swan's neck. Thus the name. I chuckled, seeing her fall into her rump as the branch finally gives way. Despite initial confusion, I quickly managed to locate what I assume is moon moss, very much as she described, blue with white dots specking its surface. I think I've got it. Good job. I can hear her strained breath as she carries a sizable heap of leaves towards me. She dumps them into the basket and inspects my find. Real good job. Her voice takes on a more impressed tone. I think this one's just sprouting. That's good. That's excellent. She perks up her tongue in a determined fashion and begins cutting at the roots of the growth. Once she has her fill, the female looks around to find her bearing. 
Really, all that would be all that would be needed is some swan's neck, but it isn't that much of a deal. Let's take a roundabout way back into the village and count for a lucky streak, hmm? Sounds good to me. I smile and proceed to follow her lead. In all fairness, I'm very confused when it comes to our bearings, so having her as a guide is quite is quite a comfort. As we walk through the thickets, I cannot help but wonder about all the different plants and berries spurning about. I'm sure it's too cold for them, although the forest does make it feel as m feel that it's much warmer than I think. I cannot help but notice. Have you actually tried? She snorts, mocking my constant vigilance, but I decide to ignore the jab. But the plants here, aren't they a bit... anachronic? My, someone ate a whole dictionary for breakfast. The female continues her teases, and I chuckle. I mean, they're slightly out of time, no? It's, it is early spring. Tiernan is very specific like that, Verissa responds, pushing away some shrubs to create a safer trail for my bare feet. It springs to life relatively quickly after winter, and plants here are governed by their own rules. To us, it's just normal, but I do understand it's quite unusual elsewhere. She shrugs, stepping over a large fallen trunk. Some call turn in the furthest part of the Everspring Woods. Everspring? I ask, stopping beside her as she's looking beneath the log for some additional specimens. Yes, it's an enchanted forest ruled over by the, by the lynxkin to the very far north of Avalon. But it's just poetic comparison. Both woods are far apart and have nothing in common. Her voice wavers as she strains to read something from underneath. Why is it called Everspring? It is said to be in the state of perpetual bloom. A female finally huffs, pulling out a handful of small mushrooms. This sounds magical. And boring. Autumns here are quite fascinating, are quite something, I can tell you. She muses while dusting off her dress and entering a more energetic step. As we pass through another thicket, I notice a large swath of purple flowers that I'm sure I recognize. I think about picking a few when she suddenly grabs my hand. What are you doing? I wanted to pick some lavender to take home. It's not that the cabin smells or anything, but it would be nice. To, but it would be a nice change of ambience. That's not lavender. The female frowns, releasing my hand. That's wolfsbane, deadly poisonous. What? I jump away, almost as if I were to be bitten by a viper. Don't worry, simply touching it won't cause you much harm. But you better not mess around with it. Damn, it looks so pretty. I could have sworn it looks like lavender. Easy mistake to make, perhaps. She concedes. But a serious one, nonetheless. A bundle of lavender will ease you to sleep. A bundle of wolfsbane will send you to the great beyond. Y yeah, no thanks. I mumble awkwardly, rubbing my arm. I should definitely stay away from picking herbs anytime soon. That's wild lavender. She points in a different direction to a bunch of green stalks in the distance. But those are barren. Verso quickly picks on my confusion. It's not the season for it. Lavender is a late summer bloom. Huh. Yeah, you better not mess with our floor unsupervised. She laughs me off and invites me to walk beside her. We continue meandering through the thicket, thickets, but despite our detour, we don't stumble upon Swan's Neck. I make sure, extra sure to inspect every moss patch we find, regardless of her protests and resignation. I want to find, I want to be useful for something. Eventually, we arrive at the main square, and she picks the wicker basket from my hand. I better head back and get those sorted. I'll check on you in the evening, before the feast, if that's all right. Sure. I won't be able to stay long, though, so don't get your expectations high. I won't. I chuckle and brush her off. Maybe my heart does sink a little that I'll have to spend the rest of the day alone, but I won't let her know it. She has a lot on her mind, and if any of this harvest is meant to create some sort of panache panacea from other... Panacea? Panacea? Is it, it's panacea, isn't it? Panacea for the wounded. If there'll be a... If there will be any wounded, then I'd rather have it leave it... Then I'd rather have her... Have her at it as soon as possible. Head straight for the cottage and don't stop for anything. We really don't need to draw any more attention, and you have a tendency to do just that. I nod and simply rush off, my silk dress swishing on the wind. There's no reason for me to run, but I really want to get out of sight, especially since more and more gazes land on me. As I pass different wolves, they express their unhappiness with me being out and about. <laughs> Where's the fire? Calls one I nearly bumped into. Ugh, can't believe he left it unattended. Now the monkey's running wild. Another jab from a complete stranger, but I don't mind. Out of six alphas in this tribe, I have confidence of three in curi I have the confidence of three in the curiosity of the fourth. I'd say I'm doing pretty fine, thank you very much. It doesn't take long to reach the house, and I jump over the steps. It's good to be home. Once I close the doors behind me, I take a deep breath and try to relax. To walk in the woods was both insightful and invigorating, as pretty much all exchanges I had with Verissa to date. Quite parched due to our stroll, I take a mug and, and dunk it into the barrel. I really need a drink. Flopping uncomfortably, flopping comfortably into the chair, I simply sip and unwind, thinking about the crazy two days I had so far. 
Despite missing Rannick a whole lot, plenty enough is going on to keep my mind occupied and buzzing with activity. From Vul's infatuation and childish outbursts to Tano's curiouser and curiouser past with Rannick. Cora's apparent sadness and their falling out and Varissa's evasiveness on the matter only add to the mystery. There's so much to think about, and my imagination runs wild. Could Tano be Rannick's first crush? Oh! Huh! Didn't think about that. It would explain this little back and forth at the feast, but then again, how would Tano take away Rannick's happiness? If they were an item, was it a heart-wrenching breakup or a story of betrayal? I snort at my wild theories. It almost feels as if I've suddenly slipped from a fairy tale territory into Spanish soap operas. Despite how exciting the speculation is, I do find it quite disturbing that Rana Cantana's feud seems to run deeper than just the superficial. Friends or lovers, I'm not sure how I feel about deep bonds like that severed so completely, especially if it was over something stupid. And knowing Rannick, it definitely was something stupid. Three years means they were still just teens. Not that I deny my wolf any credit, but he is quite patient, but he also tends to dance around the truth a whole lot. With love or friendship, that's never a good practice, especially if one is stubborn to admit wrongdoing in the first place. Then again, ooh, excuse me, Tano is a very underhanded and a sneaky guy. Maybe he fucked Rannick over one too many times. My wolf is quite principled, being constantly let down definitely would not sit well with him. Unless it was really more than that. I wonder if they... no. No, no, no. I've been getting exceedingly distracted by the horny stuff while here. It's none of my business if they did stuff or not. It, I just wouldn't want to be caught in a crossfire. Tano seems like a wolf you really do not want to piss off unintentionally. I try to keep myself occupied by tidying up the place, washing up the used-up dishes, and making sure the cottage is presentable for when Rannick finally returns. Because he will return. I just know it. In the meantime, to keep my spirits up, I'll just think of all the conversations we can have once he's back. The idea of all the answers I can get just makes me quite excited. Excited enough to steal my resolve against my pervasive thoughts. I simply pet my dandelion and drift away on a daydream to the moment I'll see that goofy wolf again. Oh lord, you're drifting off, which means you might hear the voice. Eventually, oh never mind, okay. Eventually it gets sufficiently dark that I realize my musings have taken me into the evening. With very little left to do, drifting off and overthinking stuff is pretty much all I have. And that's not good. I start up the fire and simply heat up one of the pies in a small pan. I savor the meal as much as I can, but between the warmth of the hearth and the food and the ale I begin to drift off again. A soft knock on the door stirs me up from my stupor, and I rush to open the doors. Oh, it's Cora! Hey there, pet! Uh, okay, Varissa. Cora catches me by surprise, and I blink in confusion towards Varissa's bemused muzzle. Gully the curious female followed her here, intent on going to the feast together. Well, go on. The tawny girl is overly excited, and gets me increasingly curious and awake. Finally, Varissa rummages inside of her bag and places a pinkish-looking ball onto the table. It's soap! She elongates her speech, as if she was talking to a child. For washing up! <laughs> she Now she follows up with a pantomime consisting of rubbing her own tits and pits. Tits and pits? What the fuck? Oh my god, I've never heard of that gas station. Tits and pits, oh my god. I give a discreet glance to Verissa, matching her irked expression. It smells of flower! Please, don't. Finally, the white female grabs one of her paws. He's another kin, not a moron. Sorry, Cora mutters awkwardly and readjusts her expression. Just smell it. She grabs the bar and takes a whiff, as takes a sniff, inviting me to do the same. I shrug and decide to entertain her. It smells of lavender. I blink, looking up to the white female. I had some dried florets and found an old recipe. It wasn't hard. It wasn't hard to make. Just needed some tallow. She shrugs, causing Cora to scoff in amusement. I know how to make soap, V. She blurts out through a snort, and I sigh internally. Of course she does. She's cute, nice, so much smart, and handy. I was talking... Frissa cuts off, rolling her eyes in annoyance. To myself. You need rest. You overwork yourself. Cora waves her paw and ruffles my hair. Anyway, pity we have to leave him here, but we better go. I don't want to get another scolding from Aldris. Yeah, yeah, you go ahead, hon. I'll just check in on something. Okie dokie. See you later, pet. <laughs> we wait, watching as Cora steps outside, and Verissa leans in with a whisper. Stay put. I, I nod, holding up the pinkish bar. Thanks for this, V. Oh god, I tease her with this newfound nickname. Ugh, don't you start. I made it to give you a little taste of home while Rannick's away. I assumed you wanted lavender for toiletries, and Rannick did mention you walked about you talked about soap earlier. He did? I blink, again taken aback by his constant thoughtfulness. 
It's better you wash up using this than take an accidental bath in Wolfsbane. That would not be pleasant. She snorts, causing me to shake my head. Either way, I'd better go. It's much more brief than I had hoped, but such is life. Don't worry, I get it. I nod and embrace her, causing the female to stumble slightly in shock. For a moment, I think I have crossed the line, but she reassures me by returning the hug. Stay put, she reiterates before taking her leave. Once she's out, I just bounce the bar in my hand a little and then place it on the cupboard. I am thinking of using it now for a moment, but considering how, tri how tired I've gotten, washing up would just make would just wake me up, and I'm not about to sp I'm not about to spend a lonely night in this empty house awake. Instead, I drink a deep cup of water, pet my dandelion, and put the fires out. As I pass the rack, I pick up one of Rannick's cloaks and take it with me to the bedroom. There, I pull off the dress, fold it neatly onto the chest, and slip into the linen. All right, I'm gonna pause it right there. Hey, we got some soap. And we learned not to touch or eat Wolfsbane. <laughs> I already knew that, because Wolfsbane is fucking deadly. But anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring that notification bell, leave a super thanks if you can. It always helps. Until the next video, I love you all. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye!